just activating the stream via vmix all the leds on the modem are currently green so i might be just below that threshold so hopefully the signal on 80 meters is uh, is holding up at least to the local lads yeah <laughs> thanks kim i'm monitoring discord by the way i forgot to mention that uh, uh discord if you've got the discord uh, on uh, uh, on your system um by all means go to the uh, astronomy chat room and uh, you'll be able to uh, uh, join in on the, uh, the the rest of the group there. It's on Discord. Uh, okay, and because uh, I'm monitoring it on the mobile phone, here, which you can just see I'm putting it up towards the camera, so it's, it's the only way I can do it tonight. Uh, okay, it seems to be, the stream seems to be hanging there, so the YouTube is back up and running. Just type in VK3CSJ in the YouTube search engine and look for the live symbol, and uh, that'll be me. And everything looks like it's hanging in there at the moment with the reduced RF output. So there it is. Okay, um, the Astronomical Society of Victoria, founded in 1922, comprises well over 1,600 members scattered about Victoria and other states of Australia and overseas. Membership of the society is open to all persons with an interest in astronomy. The society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy and to disseminate the knowledge of the science and to provide greater facilities for the study among its members. There are monthly meetings, which are usually held on the second Wednesday of each month, uh, at the uh, held at the uh, uh, National Herbarium, or the Mullio Hall, at uh, Burwood Avenue, in, near the Melbourne Observatory in Burwood Avenue there, not too far from the Shrine of Remembrance. Parking is available in Burwood Avenue, Dallas Brooks Drive and surrounding streets and admission is free and visitors are most welcome to uh, to the meetings there that are held. Uh, they start right on 8 o'clock and aim to finish at, uh, at 10 o'clock. Privileges of membership include the right to borrow books and periodicals, periodicals and pu other publications from the Society's extensive library located at Melbourne uh, located, where is it located? At the Melbourne Observatory. Uh, at, and after monthly meetings with a permitting. These instruments include the Society's 300mm equatorial reflector and a 300mm portable reflector. There's also a 200mm refractor, which is managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens, and a photoheliograph for also housed at the observatory and are accessible as well. The Society also has a number of 200mm reflectors available for short period loan, uh, the ASV has a loan scheme. You have to be a member, of course, to be uh, uh, to do that. And g'day, Graham. And uh, but uh, yeah, there are a whole bunch of uh, uh, mobile or portable um, Newtonian telescopes. Very easy to manage and a good way to learn how to use a telescope and look at the sky. Members are encouraged to make use of the society's country property located near Heathcote. Uh, some 90 minute drive north of Melbourne. There are a range of instruments available for members to use, the larger, uh, the larger two with appropriate training. And just reactivating my mobile, went to sleep on me. And uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, there are a range of instruments, yes, mentioned that. Uh, also located on the site is a fully steerable 8.5 uh, meter radio telescope, which mem members can access with involvement in the radio astronomy section. And a very pleasant good evening to any radio astronomy folks listening. Members are encouraged to make and use telescopes if that's the way you want to go. Uh, advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same. Instrument making is only one of the number of common interest activities catered for within the society. Other areas of interest that members can participate in include deep sky observing, astrophotography, lunar and planetary observing, um, auroral, meteor, comet, radio astronomy. Details for various section directors are provided in the yearbook. But if you don't have the yearbook, because you have to be a member to get the yearbook, uh, the website... Uh, ASV's website at www.asv.org.au is the uh, uh, 
uh, best place to go to finding contact information for section directors. There's a dedicated page dedicated to um, to all the, the sections, about 20, 21 sections there are. And uh, each link opens up a separate page which gives you information about that section and contact details. So if you're interested, even if you're not a member, uh, you're still, as far as I know, entitled to, to come along as, as a visitor. Uh, for the first time so to see if this is uh, what you're interested in and uh, become a member of the ASV just t talk to the section director and um, everything will go from there um, as I say further information may be obtained by visiting the ASV website again at www.asv.org.au Please note that the ASV will conform to all government health directives. ASV events may be required to be cancelled, moved or postponed. So that's the ASV in a nutshell. But it's been around since 1922. We're in our 100th anniversary. So it's, uh, it's, been, uh, it's been quite a ride for uh, the society over all these years. And uh, it still continues to move forward in interesting ways. Um, all right, I'm fighting a bit of a headache here. Just it just told me that the, my head's just told me that there's a headache there, so I'll take another squig of coffee. I think. All right. Without further ado, um, I think we're still okay on 80 meters, and I, and the the YouTube stream still seems to be hanging in there. So, um, what I'll do uh, is we're talking about exoplanets tonight. And uh, one of the things that I, I hope to do with my optical observatory uh, when I finally get the, um, the system up and running is, uh, is, to, uh, is to try and detect uh, those exoplanets that have already been found, of course. That's, that's the way to do it as far as amateur uh, is concerned. You, just check, you, you, know, you prove whether your system is capable of detecting the, the, the minuscule drop of light as the uh, as the the planet orbits its host star, and of course you you have to be in alignment for that to happen, but it can be done. It can be done. There are little tricks and techniques, and with modern technology these days, in regards to software, um, uh, it is possible to uh, to do it. So I'm looking forward to being able to detect uh, exoplanets, especially the the ones that are fairly easy to. But um, of course, an exoplanet or exosolar planet uh, is a planet outside the solar system. Uh, the first possible evidence of an exoplanet was noted in 1917, uh, but was not recognized as such. The first confirmation of the detection occurred in 1992. A different planet initially detected in 1988 was confirmed in 2003. As of the 1st of February 2024, there are 5,606 confirmed exoplanets in 4,136 planetary systems. How's that? With 889 systems having more than one planet. The James Webb Space Telescope is expected to discover more exoplanets and also much more about exoplanets, including composition, environmental conditions, and potential for life. There are many methods of detecting exoplanets, uh, transit photo, pho photometry, uh, Doppler spectroscopy, have found the most. But these methods suffer from a clear observational bias favoring the detection of planets near the star. Thus, 85% of the exoplanets detected are inside the tidal locking zone. In several cases, multiple planets have been observed around a star. About one in five sun-like stars have an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone. Assuming there are 200 billion stars in the Milky Way, it can be hypothesized that there are 11 billion potentially habitable Earth-sized planets in the Milky Way, rising to 40 billion if planets orbiting the numerous red dwarfs are included. 
So that's enough to whet your appetite. Um, for centuries, scientists, philosophers, and science fiction writers have suspected that exo, exo, extrasolar planets existed, but there was no way of knowing whether they were real in fact, how common they were, or how similar they might be to the planets of the solar system that we already know. Various detection claims made in the 19th century were rejected by astronomers. The first evidence of a possible exoplanet orbiting Van Manen 2 was noted in 1917, but was not recognised as such. The astronomer Walter Sidney Adams, who later became director of the Mount Wilson Observatory, produced a spectrum of the star using the Mount Wilson 60-inch telescope. He interpreted the spectrum to be of an F-type main sequence star, but it is now thought that such a spectrum could be caused by the residue of a nearby exoplanet that had been pulverized by the gravity of the star, the resulting dust then falling into the star. The first suspected scientific detection of an exoplanet occurred in 1988. Shortly afterwards, the first common of uh, confirmation of detection came in 1992 from the Arecibo Observatory with the discovery of several terrestrial mass planets orbiting the pulsar PSR B1257 plus 12. The first confirmation of an exoplanet orbiting a main sequence star was made in 1995 when a giant planet was found in a four-day orbit around the nearby star star 51 Pegasi. Some exoplanets have been imaged directly by telescopes, but the vast majority have been detected through indirect methods, such as the transit method, with the radial velocity method method, and the radial velocity method. In February 2018, researchers using the Chandra X-ray Observatory combined with a planet detection technique called microlensing, found evidence of planets in a distant galaxy, stating some of these exoplanets are as relatively small as the Moon, while others are as massive as Jupiter. Unlike Earth, most of the exoplanets are not tightly bound to stars, so they are actually wandering through space or loosely orbiting between stars. We can estimate the number of planets in this fairway, faraway galaxy uh, is more than a trillion. So I'm going to leave that. That's courtesy of uh, Wikipedia, that little quick write-up. But what I want to do now is uh, segue into the podcast, courtesy of Brendan O'Brien astrophys.com and we're going to be listening to an interview with Dr. Hannah Diamond Lowell observing exoplanet atmospheres and um, where was it yes 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 uh, she said in, in the about me on her website she says that I am a senior researcher at the National Space Institute, technically Technical University of Denmark, where I work in the exoplanet group. She says, I characterize small exoplanet atmospheres with ground and base space-based observatories. She says, I am the private, um, <laughs> um, it's a PI, what was it again? Investigator, personal, personal investigator. I think that's what the PI is. But I, I am the PI of Hot Rocks Survey. I did get that before, can't remember now. Personal investigator, private investigator. I can't remember what the P stands for. Uh, a large program on the James Webb Space Telescope to test nine terrestrial exoplanets orbiting nearby M dwarfs uh, for atmospheres. So, okay, let's go straight into this uh, podcast and hopefully it will play okay. So let me just uh, get that ready to rock and roll. And we'll just go into that. I think that's already queued up there. 
all I need to do is press the button on the mixer and let's see how we go. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel and you're about to listen to a podcast, Dr. Hannah Diamond Lowell uh, talking about observing exoplanet atmospheres with Brendan O'Brien. interview for you from Denmark with Dr. Hannah Diamond Lowe, who uses the world's newest and most powerful instruments to probe the atmospheres of distant alien planets. You'll love her stories. Hello, Hannah. Hello, Brendan. Today, listeners, we're zooming over 10 time zones to Chile, Denmark, for some cutting-edge science, and you're invited to a very special conversation. So today, I'm lucky enough to introduce you to Dr. Hannah Diamond Lowe, who is a senior researcher in the Exoplanet Group at the National Space Institute, the Technical University of Denmark, where her groundbreaking research characterizes small exoplanet atmospheres using ground and space-based observatories. She is also the principal investigator of the Hot Rock Survey, a large observing program using the now legendary James Webb Space Telescope to test terrestrial rocky exoplanets for their atmospheres as they orbit nearby M dwarf stars. As well as she's got a companion program called Hot Rock Stars, which will measure the UV output of the M dwarf hosts with Hubble data. These are the best project names <laughs> I've ever heard, Hannah. So thanks very much for speaking with us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's fun to be here. Okay, thanks. So before we talk about your current exoplanet work, can you tell us where you grew up, please, Hannah? And could you tell us how you first became interested in science and space? Yeah, definitely. So I am born and raised in New Jersey on the East Coast of the United States. And I'm kind of from the middle of the state in a town called Highland Park. So the area is a sort of kind of like dense suburbia. So I'm not actually one of those astronomers who did a lot of gazing up at the sky since, you know, there's a good bit of light pollution. I didn't really get into science and space until sort of later in my schooling, but my my dad is actually, has always been quite interested in astronomy. So like for Hanukkah one year, I got a telescope and we would sort of look at the moon and Saturn and I was into that for a while and then kind of dropped it. But I think he was kind of laying the groundwork for some for some astronomy later on. Okay. And what about those early school days and your earliest ambitions? And did your early ambitions change and evolve over time, Hannah? Yes, there was a lot of changes in evolution. So yeah, as I mentioned, there was like a small phase of my childhood of wanting to be an astronomer, but there was also, I wanted to be an archaeologist, a political scientist. I think at one point a librarian was high on the list. So I really kind of jumped around a lot. But I, I think like generally, I just always liked school and learning. And my favorite subjects were just the ones where I really liked the teachers. So at different points, I really liked English, math, history. Um, and even all through high school, I kind of jumped around a bit. But I didn't get into actually sort of focusing on science until I went for my undergraduate degree at the University of Chicago. In the US, we do this liberal arts education. So you have to take like a broad range of subjects, everything from math and science to history and literature. And then, then you choose something to major in and sort of study more in depth. So I went into college kind of thinking about maybe like I'd focus in anthropology or maybe linguistics, but definitely I was thinking something in the humanities. So at the end of my first year, I decided to do this study abroad program. And while I was studying abroad, I could take a course in astrophysics for non-majors. 
so I could get my kind of obligatory science credit out of the way, and I got to spend a quarter in Paris. So Paris was great, but I also really, really enjoyed the non-major astrophysics course. So after that, I kind of decided to start shifting more over into the sciences. Um, but I didn't actually major in physics because at that point, there wasn't enough time for me to graduate in time and take all the physics requirements. Plus, it was like a lot of physics. So I actually majored in geophysical sciences so I could take sort of a more diverse range of science courses. So I took geology, biology, biodiversity, um, but I did take a lot of sort of requirements uh, in the physics department and in the astronomy department as well. So yeah, then the rest is sort of history. I got, I got more and more into research and astronomy and then kind of that just sort of kept trending in that, in that direction eventually. You must have had some inspiring teachers and lecturers here. And absolutely. Uh, not yeah. only did you get your first bachelor's science degree in geophysical sciences, you did it with honours at the University of Chicago, and then you went east to Harvard for your five-year PhD in astronomy. Now, for our early career researchers, we know we've got some listeners who are in that category. Could you tell us how you arranged it? And firstly, why you made that big move over to Europe to take up your first postdoc position at the Department of Space Research and Space Technology at Denmark's Techniques University, the Technical University of Denmark. How and why did you do that, Hannah? Well, firstly, e excellent Danish pronunciation, I must say. Yeah, so there were... <laughs> There were a lot of reasons why um, that some sort of overlapping and some just kind of it sort of came together. I, I think it might be easier first to answer more the how, since that was kind of straightforward. So, you know, in the last year of a PhD, if you're going to continue in academia, that's when you typically kind of start applying for postdoc positions. And I was very unsure about sort of where I stood kind of compared to other graduate students. So I applied to a lot of postdoc positions. I think it was like 30. And I think that's too many since a few of those I applied to, I, I didn't, you know, weren't actually good fits for me. But kind of in the mix there was this position at DTU Space, um, since they were looking for someone in exoplanet research that focused on small planets. So I, you know, I sort of thought, okay, well, you know, throw that in the mix. So, so I had all these applications, but, but more into the why. I did have some idea that I wanted to go to Europe for a postdoc. I did a lot of my PhD in ground-based astronomy, and Europe has some of the best ground-based telescopes and instruments, but they're also building the next generation of giant ground-based telescopes. And this is happening in the US as well, but Europe is going to get there first. Yep, cool. So... You know, at the time I was applying for a postdoc, this was the end of 2019, the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope was supposed to happen at the beginning of my PhD and had not happened at all. So I was kind of thinking, well, I don't want to rely on this space telescope to launch if the timing is not going to work out for the three-year PhD. So I sort of focused my postdoc applications on ground-based research, um, and that was, you know, much easier to do for sort of the European postdocs I applied to. But I'll be honest, you know, another reason was that I just kind of wanted to have a change of pace and, and have a different sort of life experience. So I'm, I'm half British and I grew up spending a lot of time in the UK. And I always had this kind of interest of like, oh, maybe I could, you know, move to Europe at some point. But it didn't happen for my PhD, obviously. So I thought, okay, maybe, maybe a postdoc was a, a good kind of opportunity to try that. And really, you know, I'll be honest, you know, even though I had a strong kind of academic like pedigree, you know, University of Chicago and going to Harvard, I, I was really burned out by the end of my PhD. And I was not feeling very strongly about wanting to stay in academia. I mean, I really liked astronomy and I really liked the questions, but the career of an astronomer is not always just getting to do the fun sciencey parts. So I thought, well, if I'm not going to make it long term, I might as well check off some life goals. Um, and actually having that little bit of pressure off sort of being at maybe not sort of the most prestigious p 
position I could be at and having a better work-life balance um, really led me back to enjoying enjoying more, actually going to work, doing the sort of nitty-gritty stuff you have to do. So I'm, I'm really glad I ended up where I did, but it was a, not such a clear path forward all the time. Fantastic. A, a great combination of strategic thinking, adventurism. <laughs> As we'll find out a bit later, you landed in the perfect place for the research you're doing at the moment. Okay. Absolutely. Look, today, the plan is to go back to the early exoplanet atmosphere science, then have a quick look at your PhD, then hear about your latest discoveries and projects. But first, for our listeners, could we get the big picture on exoplanet atmosphere science, please, Hannah? What have been the big milestones since 2001? It, it's a science that's been only alive for 23 years. <laughs> when a Hubble spectrum showed that sodium was present in the atmosphere of HD 209458b. Now, that's quite a mouthful. <laughs> and just before you answer that question about the big milestones, can you tell us, do you give nicknames to your target exoplanets, Hannah? <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. So I I don't typically give like nicknames for the planets, but the one you specifically just mentioned, HD 209458b, that is one of the most famous planets in exoplanet studies. So people, you know, people have looked at this for years and years and years. So that one people will definitely shorten to HD 209 or even just 209. Sometimes yep. you just take the first three numbers. But I'll, I'll try to avoid throwing out too many planet numbers because they, they can get a bit of a mouthful. But if you do want a slightly sort of easier way to think about them, because it does sort of seem a random assortment of letters and numbers, the HD part of HD 209 actually stands for Henry Draper, who was an astronomer in the 1800s who made this like catalog. And so this star was the 209 thousand four hundred eighty fifth star in that catalog wow. um but henry draper in the 1800s would have had no idea that this particular star had a planet and that this would become actually a famous planet for exoplanet atmospheres anyway but sorry <laughs> back to the big picture yeah in, in many ways we're still sort of painting the big picture of exoplanet atmospheres because it's as you said just such a young field but this was a major milestone. So in 2001, sodium was detected in HD 209's atmosphere. And that paper was led by Dave Charbonneau, who was actually my PhD advisor. Wow. Um, and yeah, <laughs> shoulders of giants. Um, yeah, so this was a milestone both for exoplanet science and also demonstrating the kind of techniques we would use to pursue discoveries. So this particular one was transmission spectroscopy. I think you've had a few folks on the podcast talk about transits. Yep. So yep. transit is when a planet passes in front of its host star from our perspective. And if you make the same observation, but with a spectrograph that spreads out the incoming photons based on their wavelength, you can then get a spectrum of the transit, or we would say a transmission spectrum. And what that's doing is that light from the host star will filter through the planet's atmosphere on the way to our telescopes. And any molecules present in the exoplanet's atmosphere will block light at wavelengths specific to that molecule. And it'll make the planet look larger at those wavelengths and ultimately give us a sort of spectral fingerprint of those molecules. So for a long time, transmission spectroscopy was only possible for hot Jupiters, which are just as they sound. They are planets the size and mass of Jupiter, but orbiting much, much closer to their stars, actually closer to their host stars than Mercury is to our own sun. Yep. So very tight orbits. And these hot Jupiters have extended puffy atmospheres that lend themselves well to the technique of transmission spectroscopy. So in this way, we're detecting a host of molecules in hot Jupiters, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide in some cases. And we could sort of attempt to determine maybe where those planets formed in the disk as they migrated to their current position where we see them now. Yep. 
So from there, the observation techniques have expanded as well as the science. So you can also take an emission spectrum, which is like a transmission spectrum, except you watch as the planet passes behind its host star and you try to detect some thermal emission, some photons from the infrared. And we've also done phase curves. So that's when you actually watch the whole orbit and that gives you a wealth of information. And as these techniques have evolved and we've built bigger telescopes and more stable and more sensitive instruments, we've pushed to smaller and smaller planets. So a couple of key milestones were detecting molecules in the atmospheres of sub-Neptunes, which are planets a little bit larger and more massive than the Earth, but also still relatively puffy, so we can still access their atmospheres. We've detected things like water and methane in sub-Neptunes, and we've also detected like flat featureless transmission spectra, and we think this is the result of clouds or hazes in those planet atmospheres. And I would say the last part of the big picture, which is very much still, you know, being painted, if you will, is like pushing down to even, even smaller planets, yeah. planets that are sort of more terrestrial in nature. Fantastic. That's so cool. Okay. <laughs> We've yeah. got the big picture now. Uh, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. Now, can we have a quick look back at your PhD research to help us understand your personal research trajectory. You focused on the atmospheres of terrestrial exoplanets using ground-based optical transits and the UV output of M-dwarf host stars using space-based UV spectra. Now, what big questions were you asking and what problems were you working on then that you had to overcome to get your PhD? Yeah, so oh, that's a great question. So my PhD ended up kind of having these two pillars, which was using the ground-based telescopes to try to observe terrestrial exoplanet atmospheres, and then using Hubble to try to get UV spectra of their host stars. The UV bit didn't really come till the end of the PhD, so I'll mostly focus on the, the first part, the ground-based telescopes since I think I'll talk a little bit more about the UV bit later. So I knew from the beginning of grad school that I wanted to do exoplanet research, and I had this undergraduate background in geophysical sciences. So I really wanted to be thinking about smaller, more terrestrial-like planets. The problem was that when I started graduate school, so this would have been the fall of 2015, there were no terrestrial exoplanets that were close enough to us and also transiting so that we could actually study their atmospheres. We, we detected plenty with Kepler, but the Kepler terrestrial planets are, just, are too far away for us to do atmospheric follow-up. Yeah. But luckily, in one of the like, very first meetings with my PhD advisor, he told me that his former student Zach Berta Thompson, who's now a professor at University of Colorado Boulder. Um, Zach had just discovered exactly this kind of nearby Earth sized planet uh, transiting a nearby star that, that we could actually look at for some atmospheric follow up. So basically, as soon as I, as I got to Harvard, I applied for time to use these telescopes that Harvard is a partner in called the Magellan Telescopes. These are six and a half meter twin telescopes at the Las Campanas Observatory in Chile. So I applied for time to use a little spectrograph on one of these telescopes and I got it. So I was able to travel down there and observe some of the sort of early transits of this planet that had just been uh, discovered. So this planet was GJ1132b. Sorry, sorry for no fun nickname. But I was able to get a transmission spectrum of this nearby planet, and it was completely flat, so not a lot of evidence for an atmosphere. But given the telescope and instrument, we're, we were only really sensitive to relatively puffy atmospheres. So the flat transmission spectrum was basically telling us that the planet was, we already knew the planet was similar to the Earth in terms of size and mass. 
It might also be similar to Earth in terms of having a sort of thin atmosphere tightly packed to the surface. Or it could have been a bare rock or maybe have some weird high clouds. But but this was basically the state of the art of what was possible at the time. So as a few more kind of terrestrial exoplanets got discovered that were nearby, I would like go off down to Chile and try to get observations with Magellan. And basically, I just kept reporting flat lines for my whole PhD. Ouch. Yeah. <laughs> but getting to travel to Chile and use these amazing telescopes and be a part of that like observing community on the mountain was one of one of the really kind of great treasures of my PhD experience. I absolutely loved it. And then the aftermath of toiling away on analyzing this sort of very noisy ground-based data, looking for tiny, tiny signals that we were, you know, would barely be sensitive to. Um, that that was tough. And and especially, you know, by your third or fourth flat line, it just kind of feels like you're not uh, you're not really doing that kind of groundbreaking research you dream of, you know, when you kind of go into a PhD. So definitely some highs, highs and lows in that in that process. Oh, I think it's everyone's dream to do some observations at Paranel. <laughs> so this is actually not Paranel. It's that's the mountain over. This is a smaller observatory, but but it's a very similar location. And yeah, yeah, but yeah. Okay, uh, so that brings us up to date. Do you want to mention what might be the very latest techniques and technologies that you're using to interrogate the atmospheres of exoplanets? You've hinted at them already. What's exciting for exoplanet atmosphere scientists right now, Hannah? Yeah, I mean, I think four words, right? James Webb Space Telescope. Yeah. Um, it's, 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 it's really just opened so many doors and and given us access to planets we haven't been able to study before and also parts of the sort of electromagnetic spectrum we haven't had access to or haven't had access to at the precision that james webb can deliver and i'll try to be like a little more detailed about that i'll actually give an example one of the early sort of releases from JWST was a transmission spectrum of a sort of hot Jupiter we'd known about for a long time called, here comes another boring name, WASP-39b. And we had observed this planet before with Spitzer, which was a telescope that's now been decommissioned. But we, we had access to these infrared channels, but they're just this big sort of photometric bucket. So you're just putting all your light into this big bucket. There's not a lot of spectral information. And just from two big light buckets that Spitzer had, these two photometric band passes, there had been hints of that maybe this planet had carbon dioxide. But, you know, it, it was just a hint that you can never tell anything more than that from Spitzer. We took one look with JWST. I think it was just one transit. And you could just see this beautiful, clear feature of carbon dioxide. You know, you don't need to go and like dig into your models and do some fancy cross correlation. It's just right there. It's just glaring you in the face. Wow. Boom, carbon dioxide. Cool. So that was beautiful to see. But even in this kind of, you know, this is just supposed to be a demonstration of what James Webb could do. There was actually this second little bump kind of right next to the big CO2 feature we were seeing. And it was like, well, what is this? Like, we weren't expecting this extra little bump. And what people think now is that this is actually a, the first detection of sulfur dioxide, SO2, in the atmosphere of an exoplanet. And not only is it, you know, it's fun to detect a new molecule, but what does that mean? And we're actually this as evidence of photochemistry occurring in the atmosphere of an exoplanet, which has never before been, we've never seen evidence of that before, even though we kind of think it should happen. So all that means is that uh, sulfur dioxide is very easily broken apart by high energy photons coming from this planet's host star. So we shouldn't really be seeing it in the atmosphere. But if we are seeing it, it means there must be a sort of continual cycling of the molecule being broken, going through some chemical pathways, and then being reformed. This is a process that happens on uh, Earth. It happens on Venus. So, for example, you know, we have oxygen in Earth's atmosphere. 
photons from the sun break apart that oxygen and allow ozone to form, which is, of course, very important for, for us here on Earth. But, but just that process of photochemistry that is occurring, you know, we've now also seen it occurring in an exoplanet. So this was just kind of like a mind-blowing, you know, bonus we were not expecting at all. And I think kind of every, all these early observations and, and probably for a long time are going to have these kind of exciting things. You know, we're going to look for one thing and end up finding something else or something we weren't expecting. Fantastic. And I, I asked you what's exciting and the timbre in your voice is conveying <laughs> that excitement very well. Okay. <laughs> Look, let's do M Stars 101. I did a search on the archive server and found a paper you worked on which focused on M stars. What are M type stars and why are they the focus of your work? Yeah, so going into Exoplanet, my my sort of PhD in Exoplanets, I did not think I would spend so much time with M stars, but I'm so glad I did. So an M star, or we sometimes say an M dwarf, which just means it's it's on still on the stellar main sequence. It's a star, like the sun is a star, it fuses hydrogen in its core, but it is uh, smaller and less massive. So M dwarfs can be about 20 to 60% the radius and mass of the sun. And they're also typically much cooler. So the sun is around 5,500 Kelvin, an M dwarf will have a, a sort of effective temperature of around 3,000 Kelvin or a little bit cooler, a little bit warmer. Yep, okay. Um, M-dwarfs have a few advantages if you're interested in studying small planets, and this is sometimes referred to as the M-dwarf opportunity. And those advantages are, they, as I said, are, are smaller. So if you're looking for a transit, you're looking for the relative size in the planet to the star. If your star is smaller, the that relative size of planet to star goes up compared to if you're looking for a small planet around a much bigger star. So that's an advantage. M dwarfs are also much more numerous. So the solar neighborhood is actually about 75% M dwarfs. There's not so many sun-like stars com compared yep. to M dwarfs. So you have more opportunities to actually find transiting planets and be able to study them. And finally, because M dwarfs are cooler, their quote unquote habitable zones reside kind of closer in. So if you are interested in looking for temperate terrestrial planets and studying them, a sort of temperate planet around an M dwarf might be on an orbit of about 25 days. Now that's still pretty tough to observe, only one opportunity a month. But compare that to an Earth-like planet around a Sun-like star in the habitable zone, that only goes around once a year. So the 25 days actually looks a lot better. So this is sort of why M dwarfs are targets if you are wanting to study terrestrial-like planets. But they have a few drawbacks, which have been really fun to learn about. So an M dwarf is not just a sort of shrunken down Sun. They actually have pretty different evolutionary histories. M dwarfs are active for much longer timescales than a sun-like star. And they even in their sort of middle age on the main sequence, they actually have very different looking spectral energy distribution. So compared to sun-like stars, M dwarfs emit much more flux in the ultraviolet and extreme ultraviolet than, than sun-like counterparts. And that's important for my work because if you're trying to detect an atmosphere around a terrestrial-like planet, you are, of course, most sensitive to the very outer regions of that atmosphere because, you know, that will have more chance for light to pass through it. But also those outer regions are more susceptible to the high energy flux from the host M dwarf star that actually gets deposited in the upper atmospheric regions. So it doesn't get down to the surface. It actually gets absorbed in the outer regions of a potential planet atmosphere. So if you don't know what that star is depositing onto the exoplanet's atmosphere, you might not truly understand what you're seeing, whether or not it is 
an atmosphere with certain molecules. Maybe the planet has no atmosphere. You're not going to get the full picture unless you understand what the host M dwarf is doing. So that's why I've sort of tried to bring M dwarfs into my research and tried to kind of combine understanding M dwarfs in the UV with trying to characterize the atmospheres of terrestrial exoplanets. Fantastic. That right. makes <laughs> so much sense. Awesome. Okay. Look, right. thank you, Hannah. Now, there's another 15 papers you've worked on up on the archive server. And as you've mentioned, you've used data from Spitzer and Hubble. You've also used uh, Chandra X-ray data to look at those hot Jupiters and the hot Neptunes and triple star systems. You've been very busy, but your most recent work, obviously, as you've mentioned, is all about rocky terrestrial exoplanets. Now, there's two parts to this question, Hannah. Okay. Are you looking specifically for Earth 2.0 and <laughs> for specific biosignatures? And, and this is a big one. Could you tell us about your PI work and the Hot Rocks Project and how, oh, not how, but securing observation time with the MIRI instrument on the JWST? That is so cool. Now, yeah. Hot Rocks looks both ambitious and achievable, and it sounds absolutely fantastic. Your team must be over the moon with this one. <laughs> what are they up to right now? And when can we expect your atmospheric analyses of the targets you've selected? When can we expect them to be published? Now, what's the timeline, Hannah? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Big question. Um, to, to start with the, the Earth 2.0 question, um, I'm going to try to make like a metaphor here. So I think that looking for Earth 2.0 is like looking for buried treasure. Yep. So it's incredibly exciting uh, to think about. And I, and I think this is, you know, the direction we're moving as a field to try to look for Earth-like planets around sun-like stars and try to determine if they have um, atmospheres or other properties similar to our own. Um, but just as with buried treasure, it might not be, you know, you know, it might not end up being everything you dreamed of and all the gold and jewels. We also have to be aware that what we might not actually find something that looks exactly like an Earth 2.0. And yep. so we can either sort of relax what we, what we think of as an Earth analog. But even more importantly, back to my buried treasure metaphor, you know, isn't it just as much about the journey and the adventure and, you know, the friends you make along the way? So on the way to actually developing the capability to look for and detect an Earth 2.0, we're finding so many incredible planets, and we're only just beginning to be able to characterize those atmospheres. Yep. So I don't sort of wake up every day thinking about Earth 2.0. Maybe I would say I actually spend more time thinking about like Venus 2.0, since typically the terrestrial planets we have access to are hotter than the Earth. Yep. So it's, I mean, for me, it's more about like, there, there is so much to learn about exoplanets and so much just to learn about planets in general, populations, atmospheres, and, and thinking about where our own solar system fits into that is still a very open question. You know, we still, you know, we can maybe access some sort of Venus-like planets, hotter planets orbiting near M dwarf stars. But what about cooler planets, you know, planets out to where maybe where like Neptune is? What about the moons of those planets? So there's so much sort of discovery space that I think is worth exploring. And if we if we only just go try to go straight for Earth 2.0, we're going to miss a lot of really interesting science that I think ultimately will, will help us more to get there yeah. um, in the future. Yeah. So sort of one of these adventures along the way that I'm, that I'm working towards is, is to ask whether or not terrestrial worlds around M dwarfs can even have atmospheres at all. Um, so when I sort of talked a little bit about M dwarfs, you know, they have these very different histories, they have much more high energy outputs, and this stuff can be damaging for exoplanet atmospheres. Uh, so there's been a sort of, you know, question for a long time, like, 
yeah, these stars present really exciting opportunities for detecting terrestrial exoplanets. But does it stop there? Are those planets just barren rocks? And if they are, that's also interesting because then you can study their surfaces and what those look like. But in the Hot Rock Survey, we want to go after the low hanging fruit. So these are terrestrial worlds orbiting very close to their M dwarf host stars. And those M dwarfs are in turn close to us. So, so we get more photons from them. So this is important because even though I've talked a lot about transmission spectroscopy, the Hot Rock Survey is doing like the opposite of that. We're going back to basics. We are watching these planets in secondary eclipse. So when they pass behind their host stars, so like the opposite of a transit. And we're using the MIRI instrument on JWST as a photometer. So as, as a big photon bucket out at 15 microns, so well into the infrared. So we're actually not getting spectra at all. We're just getting one big data point out at 15 microns. And we do this because with the photon bucket, you just can collect many, many more photons. And the secondary eclipse signal, so the kind of, um, you know, you can think of the transit dip. It's kind of the same thing in secondary eclipse, but much, much shallower. So you're looking for this tiny signal. You need as many photons as you can get. And the, the point of all of this is not so much to characterize an atmosphere, but to ask whether or not an atmosphere is even present on these planets. So that's the main kind of goal of the Hot Rock Survey. I will say to get the time to do this on James Webb is incredibly competitive and you need a lot of luck just to get it also. So it was a lot of hard work by myself, my, my co-PI, Joao Mendonça. And also the whole team sort of like thinking about this question early on. So it was a lot of work and a lot of luck to get that time. And if you are out there and you have applied for time on James Webb and like me, been rejected many times, keep trying. It will happen at some point. Um, yeah, so where we are right now with the survey is we're just at the beginning. So we only got our first observation uh, at the end of November. For the nine planets in the survey, for most of them, we actually have to stack together multiple observations. So even though we got one observation, you know, we might be waiting for a second observation. And the way the James Webb scheduling works, you don't have much control over that. So we don't have any completed data sets yet, but we are currently in the sort of data collection phase. And that is also coming with a lot of preliminary analysis and a lot of hard work trying to build up these pipelines, these codes to analyze the data, to be able to do the best we can do to try to pull out this tiny, tiny signal. And I am so, so lucky to have a really great team of international researchers who are really excited about this work. So as, as I said, we have nine planets in the survey. And each planet has what we're calling like a data set champion. So someone who is responsible for getting that planet out sort of to publication. So they'll do the lead analysis and write the paper and this will sort of be like their planet. And then there's going to be lots and lots of future work to do. And that's going to, of course, kind of be open to everyone. Um, but I'm, I'm really proud that all of our data set champions are early career researchers. So they're all either PhD students or postdocs. And this is great because they have the time to really dig into this data and get it to where it needs to be. And of course, I think it's also important to promote uh, students and postdocs as they make their way through the first stages of their careers. So yeah, the team is working hard. We're super excited. We're just sort of spinning up our kind of biweekly meetings, trying to compare pipeline results. And, you know, a timeline is always tough. We're hoping to get our first results out by the summer. We won't have our first completed data set until the end of this month. So it's even, even though we have made a few observations, we don't have a completed data set on any one planet that we can start pushing on. So that'll come in a couple of weeks. So very exciting time, but just, just at the beginning. So I don't have any like big results to share, but maybe I can give you a few hints.
Fantastic. That is so exciting. And <laughs> just getting the time on the James Webb Space Telescope is a huge achievement in itself. I <laughs> can't imagine yeah. how competitive it is. And look, just a quick change of pace here. Here's a quote, listeners, from Hannah, which I know will astound some of you. It's <laughs> mind boggling. Here it is. Quote, there are more planets than stars in the Milky Way, and Earth-sized exoplanets are the most common, unquote. Huh. Now, <laughs> we know very well that science doesn't always sail smoothly, and we're very happy to put on our propeller heads. You've already challenged us quite a bit. Um, could you share with us some details of a particular part of your small exoplanet atmospheric research that you're working on right now that's driving you crazy or is <laughs> astonishingly exciting or maybe it's both hannah yes <laughs> so definitely the most exciting thing in my life right now is the hot rock survey or i should say yep. my my work life right now is is the hot rock survey um, and it is astonishingly exciting and also driving me crazy <laughs> so it, it's really a mixture of both um, i think i've sort of communicated a bit you know why why it's exciting we're, we're getting a first look at these planets we're gonna try to understand on a large scale if these terrestrial worlds can even have atmospheres um, but the piece that really keeps me up at night is that the the method we're using to do this um as i mentioned is you know the planets are passing behind their host stars and that means that the secondary eclipse signal has actually never been seen before because we've never had a telescope that could even detect it yeah. and so what keeps me up at night is the concept of orbital eccentricity which <laughs> sounds super boring but it is truly terrifying Basically, this is, you know, the idea that, um, you know, a sort of simple model of, of planets, it's that they're on these sort of perfectly circular orbits, but there is actually usually some small amount of eccentricity. And this was sort of the thing that, you know, Kepler figured out back in the day. Um, the problem is that if you have a an orbit with enough eccentricity, then just because you see the transit doesn't mean you actually know when the secondary eclipse is going to happen. And, Ooh. you know, if, if you don't know by a few seconds or a few minutes, okay, that's fine. We always get time before and after. But if the eccentricity is high enough, you could end up being uncertain by a few hours. Yep. And that is, that's too much. You can't ask for, you know, tons and tons of time just to maybe catch something. Or you can, but you need a much better reason. So a lot of work and a lot of, you know, emails to dynamicists and um, sort of, you know, probability calculations went into trying to make sure that we could actually catch these events. Now, the fun piece I'm, I'm going to share with you is we do have already from the program four secondary eclipse observations out of what will be a total of 22. And we think we are seeing the dip that we are looking for in all four of those observations. Nice. But we want to make really, really sure that we are not being tricked by maybe some noise, maybe an unlucky systematic. So this means that we have to comb through all of the auxiliary data that James Webb collects while it observes and see if there's anything that might be tricking us into thinking that this little dip is actually due to something else. So, so for example, as JWST is settling into its life out in space, um, kind of, it's sort of like a house that creaks a little bit. So there's these sudden, like they call them these um, mirror tilt events that have been observed to happen. There's nothing wrong with the telescope. This is completely normal. But if one of those little mirror tilt event happens, it just kind of creates a little shift, a little offset in your data. Mm. And that's fine. You, you can correct for it. And this one's actually pretty easy. You, you can easily check if, if that has happened. Um, but if you don't check and one of those happens, you might think that there is an eclipse somewhere where there isn't one. Or maybe you might think your eclipse is deeper than you think. And, you know, you'd have to be pretty 
unlucky with the timing, but but it's certainly not impossible. Um, so that's a kind of easier one to check for, but there's many, many other little things like that. And, you know, ultimately, we're looking in this, in these secondary eclipses, we're looking for signals at the level of a few tens to hundreds of parts per million. So that is a dip, that is that signal is about 0.01%. Whoa. So it's really, really small. This is not something that was remotely possible before JWST. So we're already kind of like pushing it to the the limits of what we can detect. Um, But it's it's just not an easy signal to pull out. James Webb can certainly do it, but it's, you know, we're not getting these like big, beautiful transit signals that that maybe you saw from like the the big press releases uh, from JWST. We're, We're looking for itty bitty tiny signals that we're hoping are actually in the data. So very exciting. Also, very much driving me crazy. Wow, pushing the (laughs) Okay. Look, I've had a look at some of your published papers. And I noticed that you wrote a number of them when the COVID pandemic was at its peak back in 2021. Mm. And Denmark has been a success story in many ways with its act fast and act with force policy, a bit like ours here in Victoria. Denmark Mm. came through relatively unscathed compared with some neighbouring and many comparatively sized countries. How did COVID affect you and your family and What was the impact on your astrophysics research and what were the lessons that were learned there? Yeah, I would say, you know, the, well, I'll first just say I I was very fortunate that my friends and family came through COVID okay and everyone's fine and healthy. Um, I actually moved to Denmark in September 2020, so sort of right in the middle of the pandemic, um, which was (laughs) you know, had like two masks on, you know, like barely eating on the plane. It was not the easiest move, but it was much more controlled here in Denmark. There was much more compliance with, you know, if there was a mask mandate in place, everyone wore their mask. When the vaccine became available, everyone voluntarily got their vaccine. And it's meant, it meant that Denmark was able to sort of open up more quickly and open up more fully. So, you know, even going back to the U.S., sort of some years later, and there's still sort of half people are masking, or there's some small outbreaks, Denmark was able to, I think, quite effectively sort of, yeah, lock down hard, but then open up much, much more easily. Now, this is a much smaller country. um, And there's a lot more trust in government here. So that's, that's definitely something they were able to do. But as far as it affected my research, um, you know, we were sort of encouraged to limit going into the office. So I had to do a sort of hybrid work from home thing, which was a bit tough at first because I had no furniture. So I would sort of be like sitting on the floor, you know, just hooked into an ethernet cable, kind of like typing away. But yeah, I, I luckily had already had some research projects that I was kind of finishing up for my thesis. So yeah, it was definitely tough to like kind of start collaborations here, even with my coworkers, because I wasn't seeing them. And it's, you know, it's tough to kind of meet people over Zoom and even tougher to then sort of have that those conversations that can really get a kind of collaboration going. Yeah. So I sort of just focused on finishing up some work for my PhD. And I would say I, I was pretty lucky with, I, I only lost one potential transit observation due to COVID, like a COVID had, there was a shutdown at the telescope. Um, And in the greater scheme of things, that's manageable. The one sort of, you know, the one upside to observational astronomy is, you know, when a space telescope is taking your data, the the space telescope can, can operate even if you are not able to go into your office. So, you know, because I don't have a lab, I was able to keep working and sometimes, honestly, just being kind of home with nothing to do when nothing's open, I was like, well, might as well get some research done. So it, uh, it wasn't too bad, honestly. But but I, I do think in terms of, yeah, you asked about lessons learned. I think everyone had a very different kind of COVID experience. And it was definitely a time of sort of 
thinking a bit more about my colleagues as sort of human beings and their personal lives, you know, just because you're zooming with people at home and like someone's kid runs by and, you know, it's just sort of, it was uh, having a bit more kind of compassion about, you know, oh, this person didn't respond to my email. And then you get on a Zoom with them and it's like their house is in chaos because, you know, they've been working at home and, you know, their spouse and their kids and their dog is, you know, barking. And, you know, it sort of gave me um, like, okay, everyone here is a person. Let's give some grace and give some give some time. And um, I, I think a lot of people experience that as well. So I think I think it's been in some ways positive for for the field and for sort of academic life in general. Yeah, indeed. And look, while we're on the topic of humanity, and um, <laughs> it's a good segue here, you've painted the big picture of exoplanet atmospheres. We've looked at your early research and your most current work, and we've gone all sciencey just for a little while. But Hannah, would you like to tell us about some of the things outside your work at DTU Space? What brings you regular uh, experiences of great joy in your life? Sure. I try to have a sort of rich, full life out outside of my work. I think the work-life balance is really important, and um, it's been a great sort of life experience to live in. In Denmark, I live in the capital city of Copenhagen. I live here with my partner, so who we moved together here from the U.S. So we're always spending our weekends um, trying to go somewhere new in the city. Um, there's always kind of art shows that are being put on, usually a concert you can see. There's great restaurants, great bars. So I, I really like sort of traveling and exploring new places. So it's been so much fun to do that um, in, in a new country. And it's also been, you know, sort of so much fun to, to kind of go around and see, um, you know, you can just like take a train and be in a different country, in a different city and coming from somewhere like the U.S. that is so exciting and so novel. So that's kind of what a weekend will look like. I really like to camp and, and hike and go backpacking. So there's been great opportunities to do that, not in Denmark, but in Norway and in Sweden, which are very nearby. So I've been taking a lot of advantage of that for sort of a little longer, longer kind of week vacation. It, it's been really rewarding to to sort of live somewhere where that's that's expected and encouraged to take that time to yourself. And so I've I've really tried to take advantage of that and sort of make sure I incorporate that, you know, for, for the next stage, whatever I do next, I want to make sure that um, I honor the life part of the work life. Fantastic. I'm having a bit of <laughs> envy attack here. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Look, you're teaching, you're mentoring graduates and undergraduates, uh, you're leading your study groups, you're a PI leading an incredibly talented research team. And you have a long history of giving invited talks to colleagues and open talks to the general public. Is outreach an important part of being an astrophysicist? Yes. I think it's not just an important part, but kind of an integral part to the job. So what I do is basic research, and most of my work is publicly funded through national grants, and so that means that, you know, to some degree, taxpayer dollars go to make this research happen. And that means that you have to give that back to the people, um, and especially if they're interested, just to sort of make that available. Um, it took me kind of a while to figure out what kind of outreach I like to do. I think a lot of people are, are really excited about kind of encouraging the next generation of scientists. And I think that is incredibly important, but I have really never liked working with kids. And so I would sort of do a couple of things like that and just be completely exhausted and, and not, not in a fun way. And then towards the end of uh, graduate school, I um, signed up to be a part of this series called the Beacon Hill Lecture Series. And it's basically a set of courses that um, retired uh, folks can sign up for. So these people are not necessarily scientists or engineers or anything like that in their professional lives, but maybe have always had a personal interest in astronomy. And now they're retired, so they can, you know, take these classes in the middle of the day in, in Boston. Um, and so I gave an hour lecture on 
sort of the the field of exoplanets. And that was super fun. I loved it. I loved getting questions from these, you know, really interested people who, yeah, maybe they're not going to have a second career as an astronomer, but I think they're absolutely, you know, deserving of being reached out to, to sort of explain what's happening in the current field of, of, of astronomy. So I've, I've definitely continued that. There's a similar lecture series here in Denmark called the Fuki University. So it's like the People's University. So I have given um, lectures on exoplanets for a sort of astronomy course that that anyone anyone in Denmark can sign up for. But again, it's usually generally like retired folks looking to continue learning and continue being curious. And, and that's been really enjoyable. So I've done more of that kind of outreach after I figured out that, oh, I don't I don't have to go into elementary school classrooms. I can actually, you know, talk to sort of the the part of the population that that I really enjoy reaching out to. And, and I think that's just as valuable since, you know, they're the ones actually helping to fund the research. And we should also focus on, you know, people at all stages of their lives trying to learn and, and being curious. Excellent. Thank you very much, Hannah. Now, <laughs> finally, the mic is all yours and you've got the opportunity now to give us your favourite rant or rave about one of the challenges that we face in science, in equity, in representations of diversity or science denialism, I've got a long list here, science career <laughs> paths, your own passion for research, or as you've hinted at before, our human quest for new knowledge. The microphone's all yours, Hannah. Thank you. I think I mentioned at the top that I always had all these interests in school before landing in astronomy. And one of them is that I've always loved to read and I love literature and, and even a little bit of writing to some extent, but, but mostly reading. And as I've gone further and further in astronomy, I find myself thinking more and more about sort of narrative and stories um, and how actually just as important of science research is the communication of that research. And there are stories about our research, there's stories about ourselves and being sort of aware of where you are in a story or how a story has formed about your research, about your career, I think is something that's been been really, well, I, I've really found it powerful to think about recently. So I, I'll give kind of a few examples, or I'll give two examples. For example, you know, my career story changed a lot when I got this Hot Rocks program accepted to JWST. And, you know, it's very good to keep a positive attitude. And this is a really great story to tell. You know, I, I studied these terrestrial exoplanets as a grad student, kind of struggled, and then, you know, finally made it to this, this big program that's going to answer some of these questions that, that I am genuinely excited about. But what's kind of hidden in that story are a lot of rejections and a lot of setbacks and really some wavering on whether or not I wanted to continue even working in astronomy or not. And, you know, my story from like two years ago was a little bit meandering, a little bit lost in a way. And then suddenly this one sort of lucky thing happens and that really turns the whole thing around. And I think it's important to sort of be aware of how that story is changing. One, because it can be, you know, in one sense, like, you know, keep going, it, it can change. And But in another to sort of remember that like, this was not, you know, predetermined. This that the, there was no sort of steady march towards where I am today. It was there was a lot of uncertainty, and I think there was just as good a chance that my program wouldn't be accepted, and maybe I would have kept going, and maybe not. And who knows? And that's kind of you know you have to sort of take these things that the universe <laughs> kind of throws at you. Yeah. But I think it's also important too to realize that science is also about storytelling. And I'll give one last example. Um, this is sort of about a paper I published in 2022. And I will give a nickname to this system. It's called the K23 system. And it has three planets, and I'll call these the three bears. And the first planet closest to the sun, this is like the big bear. It's a sub-Neptune. It's larger, more massive than the Earth. It's puffier. And then there's kind of sort of further out from that, there's a slightly smaller planet, maybe sort of between a sub-Neptune and a rocky planet in terms of size and mass. And then farther out, just kissing the habitable zone of this system, 
was this little planet that we thought was terrestrial, you know, ooh, maybe this is the perfect planet for life, you know, right in the Goldilocks zone, you know, Goldilocks and three bears. Okay. So <laughs> when I was first looking at this system, I thought, okay, this is cool. We have three planets. They're around a common host star. So I can kind of put all this data together, use our models of atmospheric mass loss and evolution, and, and just sort of explain the story that I was clearly seeing with these, you know, these three planets. One may be perfectly in the habitable zone. But while I was putting together the observations and models from my colleagues and sort of digging into the literature, it wasn't, the story was not fitting together. There, there kept being these pieces that didn't make sense. And instead of just ignoring those, I kind of tried to bring those in and, and see what was happening. And what I ended up with is, is actually a very different story where it actually seems that maybe these planets formed farther out than we currently see them and migrated inwards, which means that that outer planet that I thought was my, you know, just right rocky planet in the habitable zone, I'm now thinking actually, it's just a sort of much smaller version of a sub Neptune, something that has a puffier atmosphere than we expect. And the best part of this story is that it needs an epilogue. So now there's more work to do to try to test that hypothesis, see what's actually going on. But, you know, just like with this system and with, you know, sort of our lives and really anything that happens, just sort of learning through that scientific process to be open to maybe the story is not going the way you think it's going to go. And that doesn't mean it has to be worse. It just means it has to be, it, it can be different and sort of being open to that and open to a, a maybe even more exciting outcome, I think is really important in, in science and, and in our careers and also, you know, also in life. So that's what I've been thinking about recently. Fantastic. And you are a, indeed a storyteller. You've, um, <laughs> you've combined art, science, literature, and storytelling all in one here for the last hour with the Santa. Look, just before we go, is there anything else we should watch out for in the near future? What are you keeping your eye on? Yeah, so um, please stay tuned for results from the Hot Rock survey. But, um, but I also think there's a lot of really interesting research, uh, you know, definitely anything for exoplanets coming out of James Webb is going to be really exciting. But I also just want to make a quick plug uh, to don't lose faith in your ground-based telescopes. There is so much interesting work coming out of ground-based telescopes from high-resolution spectrographs. This is a whole other kind of technique for trying to detect atmospheres that I didn't even get a chance to talk about. But we are trying to build these next-generation ground-based telescopes, and these really are not they're not competing with JWST. They're really complementary and they're really necessary. There's yeah. some things that you can do from the ground, make these very, very technically sort of finicky instruments that you need to constantly tune that you just can't do from space. And so I, I don't want people to think that, oh, just because we've put up James Webb, we can forget about all these amazing ground-based telescopes that people work on, maintain, and they are still producing really exciting science. So I, I would say don't don't lose faith in your ground-based observations. Fantastic. And there's some amazing instruments being constructed as we speak. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hannah Diamond Lowe. On behalf of all of our listeners and especially from me, it's been really <laughs> exciting to be speaking with you way over there in Denmark chilly as it is and hot as it is here. <laughs> Thank you especially for your time and your amazing schedule and the pressures to analyse all that beautiful hot rocks data that a JWST is going to be or is and will be beaming down to you. Search uh, your wonderful weekends that you're having and all your future travels and our listeners can tune in to the work that the Exoplanets Group do. They can see the people and their research. It's all at exoplanets.dk. Mm -hmm. May your career continue to be out of this world. Thank you, Hannah. Oh, thank you so much. This was so much fun. <laughs> Excellent. Bye-bye.
Yes, there's the mic. All right. One, two, three. One, two, three. We are here, still awake. Oh, okay. I thank uh, Brendan uh, Bryan for allowing me to uh, to run that broadcast. Um, and um, uh, most interesting indeed, uh, listening to uh, um, Hannah uh, Lowe talking about her interest in uh, exoplanets and... Um, her research is definitely going to be uh, uh, very interesting to follow. So, um, uh, yeah, be yeah, be interesting to see what comes from uh, from for the further research that comes from um, what she's up to. Uh, this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, VK3 EKH, um, on behalf of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, regular Friday night broadcast. Hope you enjoyed that. I hope the copy was okay. There's a few little audio artifacts from time to time. Um, it's the um, listening to uh, to the audio file direct. It's uh, much more fi, but uh, certainly uh, on SSB it gets a little bit uh, um, squashed up a bit. I think uh, the best uh, uh, listen to is on the YouTube feed and of course RTV. Um, but nevertheless, um, all right, look, it's uh, 20 past, uh, more than that now, 23 past the hour. So if you guys have decided to go to bed, that's fine by me. <laughs> um, I'll just very quickly run through space, uh, what's happening with space weather. And um, this is the, the current disk of the sun. Uh, let's see, where, where, where is our thing here? Okay, so... Um, um, the, the solar wind is currently at 407.3 kilometres per second. I think we had a little bit of that, a taste of that earlier this week at a density of 4.27 protons per cubic centimetre. There's several sunspots on the disk of the sun right now, more than several in fact. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There's 10 designated uh, sunspots uh, there. And uh, the current sunspot number overall is 151. And the, the radio sun, measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimetres, is uh, uh, currently 178 solar flux units. <clears throat> uh, the forecast calls for quiet. No CMEs are heading for Earth. Uh, as a result, geomagnetic storms are unlikely for the next three days. So this could change if the sun suddenly produces a large, big, fast eruption. But for now, the forecast the forecasts calls uh, are for quiet to times. So uh, the uh, uh, band conditions uh, on HF should be fairly stable. Um, okay, what else? The uh, aurora over Antarctica at the moment is fairly uh, uh, low to speak of. Um, I do have a shot of that as well. There it is. So um, for those watching Visions, um, you can see that the aur auroral ring uh, or activity over Antarctica is quite low. Nothing much to uh, to talk about, really. Uh, and uh, apart from all that, uh, the KP index. Where was the KP index? I always usually mention that too. Uh, KP, the, the K planetary K index, KP index is 0.67, considered quiet. The 24-hour max will, is, is 1.67, but also considered quiet. And uh, I think that's about it. Um, uh, as of the 16th of February 2024, there were 2,349 potentially hazardous asteroids. But none of those are on a collision course with Earth at this present point in time. So with that, uh, I shall uh, conclude the transmission for tonight. Uh, I received emails from uh, Andrew VK3KIS and, and Steve VK3SBX. Um, several folks on the um, uh, <laughs> on the uh, Discord uh, channel: um, Kim VK5FUSC, um, Martin VK7JAH. Uh, uh, who else is there that I saw? Cassiope here was it last week? I think it might have been last week. Um, yeah, so. Um, just a small handful of folks, and also an email from Steve VK3HK um, and Graham VK3GL. So, uh, yeah, thanks, folks. At least I know there were some people out there listening tonight. 
All right, let's uh, open up the frequency and uh, see if we can. Uh, if there's any stations wishing to uh, to check in at this late hour. My apologies for going over time. Usually, Brendan's uh, interviews are only about half an hour, maybe maybe as much as forty five minutes. Um, but there's only there's there's only just a, a, a you know less than a handful that um, uh, he'll go beyond uh, the sixty minute mark. So uh, I guess it, it just depends on uh, what he considers to be worthwhile. Uh, um, interview sort of thing. Anyway, thanks, Brendan. I, I know you're probably listening somewhere in the background there, um, so I do appreciate uh, the uh, chance to play that. Uh, this is VK3EKH, listening on 3541 for any stations that may still be around. Everybody's on top of each other. Uh, VK3GL, VK3DX, and I think um, VK3SPX SPX was there as well. And uh, I think Martin might be there, VK7JAH. But you're all, all sort of doubled up on each other. Um, try again. I've got VK3GL, VK3DX, VK3SPX, I think, VK7JAH. Who else did I get? And I think that might have been Andrew VK three KIS right down there in the noise. All right, and I think it was, it was VK three GOD was that last one there too. And Ian VK three VIM. All right, at top of the list, Graham VK three Golf Lima VK three EKH. Go ahead, old man. Yeah, thanks, Chrome. VK3GL, VK3EKH, returning. Not a problem. Yes, um, um, I've only had the COVID once uh, so far, and uh, I um, don't wish to get it again. <laughs> uh, but uh, with with the uh, the new strains that seem to kick around from time to time, they uh, they'll always uh, um, there's always that chance of being able to pick up this stuff. 
especially when you go to places like supermarkets and things like that. Sorry to hear that Alison's uh, picked it up uh, again. It's um, it's such an issue, isn't it? Um, all right, thanks for the report, and uh, and I I tend to agree. Uh, the uh, the podcasts, particularly the the podcasts that Brendan does. Uh, um, uh, t- tends to have that uh, very digital aspect to them, the artifacts that you can hear and pick up on it. And it's uh, again, it, it's it's cleaner to listen to the file directly in the, in in studio, so to speak, and uh, also uh, uh, the feed over the TV repeater uh, that I, I pick up on, as well as YouTube, is much cleaner. So yeah, running it over. So I, if if I ran an AM transmission, that might be a bit different, actually. But that's another that's another story. <laughs> Thanks, Chrome. All right, um, uh, and uh, um, hopefully we'll catch up over the weekend. Hint, hint. All right, uh, Greg VK3 Delta X-ray VK3 EKH. Thanks, Greg. VK3 Delta X-ray, VK3 EKH returning. Very good. Thank you very much, Lee, uh, for the report and hanging in there for the end of it all. And um, I, I, I agree. I, I think um, the <laughs> it's interesting. The majority of the interviews that, uh, uh, that Brendan does on his astrophys are mostly female uh, scientists or um, physicists uh, or astronomers. So there's a very very good library. He's he's developed a, a really good library of um, of uh, the the female um, uh, collection of uh, of astronomers. It's quite a, a, a an interesting library, so to speak. So um, um, where when when he finds uh, uh, a um, a young lass that's uh, got herself right into the uh, the field of astrophysics and particular study in astronomy. He's uh, he's certainly uh, gets in contact with them, and it's it's really good to hear them. So uh, I'm 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 very happy and, and very pleased to to hear of uh, these uh, ladies that really get into the field um, of astronomy and um, and uh, to be able to get a chance to. Uh, uh, to uh, spend time on some of these instruments that, um, that the governments have spent lots of money on, uh, you know, as he, as she as she was saying, just to find time to uh, to get on to the James Webb Space Telescope and other such like um, instruments, uh, you've got to book ahead and you've got to um, uh, you know put forward a, a a reason for wanting to borrow time on on these telescopes and it's, it's a really it's a very very sophisticated arrangement these days so uh, you know astronomy has come a, a long way um, that is for sure. Anyway, all right, uh, it's now, I think, Steve, you were there, VK3, SBX, VK3, EKH. No, I thought I might not have heard him. Steve, you there, VK3, SBX, VK3, EKH? No, okay. Uh, Krusty there, Martin, VK7, JAH, VK3, EKH. We're working on it.
Yeah, no worries, Martin. VK seven J A H VK three E K H. Yeah, look, I'm I'm running um I'm I'm running low power uh, at the moment until I can work out um, uh, this RF issue with the uh, the blasted modem. Um, uh, I've got to keep the, uh, the the power level low, so I'm certainly <laughs> I'm certainly not running my normal uh, 400 odd watts. So. Um, uh, I'll I'll have a bit of a play with this over the weekend and and see if I can uh, work out a way of um, getting this modem to uh, to behave. Um, there, there's there's five ports uh, on this modem and I've got every cable disconnected other than the only ether, only the Ethernet cable that's connected to to the computer here on on this workbench uh, the operating bench and that's uh, that's uh, you know that's about. F- Oh, um, probably about five meter long cable, so uh, it's just a big aerial, and uh, I I don't uh, I don't doubt that RF's getting into it, so um, I have to work out uh, what to do about that. Anyway, we'll get there, but um, hopefully next week I'll be back to uh, normal powers on uh, on eighty, <laughs> um, and no RF getting into anything that would please me. <laughs> Um, thanks, Martin. Good on you, mate. And uh, I'll let you go now. <laughs> uh, Ian, VK3VIN, VK3EKH. Go ahead, Ian. Uh, thanks, uh, Ian. VK3VIN, VK3EKH. 
Um, did Frank call in? Did he? <laughs> um, Frank must have been uh, uh, somebody. One of the stations must have doubled with him, and uh, I didn't uh, didn't exactly copy. So if you're there, Frank, stand by. I'll pick you up in just a short moment or two. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Well, you're about to 15, uh, 10 to fifteen over nine yourself. So you know, despite the uh, the lower power level, um, I'm not doing too bad. It seems so. Um, uh, there it is, but um, no, I know the uh, oh, the extra wattage does help a little bit to, to uh, get the signal further out. So, um, uh, we'll, like I said, we'll try and get that sus- sussed out for next week, so we're back to normal. Um, but anyway, we're like I said, I'm, I'm in a, in a new studio environment, and we're still you know still getting things set up around here. But thanks, uh, Ian. And um, uh, what was the other thing? Um, Oh, I can't remember now. It doesn't matter. All right. <laughs> Thanks, mate. And, uh, yeah, apologies for uh, for the, the longer session tonight. It, it won't be this long next week. Well, maybe. No. <laughs> All right. I think the next station was Robert, uh, VK3GOD. I think uh, VK3GOD, VK3EKH. Go ahead. Yeah, good on you, Robert. VK3 GOD, VK3 EKH, not a problem. And uh, okay on um, uh, on the dark sky side. Yes, look, it is in an impressive uh, area. It's uh, you know it, it it kicked off in the early two thousands, um, and um, I think the, uh, the 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 way they've progressed over these last uh, few years has been fantastic. With the uh, the addition of easy work walking paths uh, for uh, folks that might be in a wheelchair, you know, disabled folks to some degree can get around a bit easier than it, what might have been before. Um, there's a telescope there that allows people that are that are in wheelchairs to, to be able to look through the eyepiece comfortably, that sort of stuff. Um, not to mention the radio astronomy set installation. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of good things going on. So um, I, I'm glad that you uh, found uh, found the site um, of some value. And uh, uh, likewise, uh, I've I have a, a Celestron uh, eight inch uh, telescope, and uh, it's it's quite portable. And uh, I, I haven't done it yet, but I, I hope that uh, some stage in the near future I will uh, I will take that telescope up there to the observation field and take the advantage of uh, darker skies, well, better better skies than it is here in Narrowarren South. So uh, I'll, hopefully I'll do that eventually. Thanks, Robert. Good on you, mate. Thanks for joining in. It's good signal from you too. You're about uh, 10 to 15 over two. Uh, Andrew, VK3KIS. Now, you're fairly weak, but uh, I think that was you calling in there at the end. VK3KIS, VK3EKH. Uh, VK3EKH, VK3EKH. No, that's a good signal. Thanks, Andrew. VK3 KIS, VK3 EKH. Good signal. That 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 50 watts is really working for you. So <laughs> you're almost 20 over. So uh, thank you for turning up the the the, uh, the wick. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Look, as far as I know, IO does have a uh, um, uh, an atmosphere to some degree. 
and uh, certainly it's one of the most volcanic uh, moons in the solar system for obvious reasons in regards to tidal uh, tidal effects that uh, that Jupiter has uh, on on the moon. Um, so uh, cheers, Kim. The K five FUSC is just giving me the the peace symbol there, or something similar, the Vulcan symbol. <laughs> anyway, cheers to you there, Greg Kim. Thanks for uh, joining in. Um, yeah. So, uh, but you're quite right. Uh, the uh, the amount of volcanic activity uh, on that uh, particular moon uh, is. Um, uh, the uh, the sulfur the amount of sulfur that's produced it does actually leach so to speak uh, leach into uh, into the surrounding environment um, and in fact uh, it's that sulf that sulfur gets caught up in the magnetic field uh, of uh, Jupiter and uh, the the relationship between Jupiter and Io and uh, it it creates a uh, a um, um, uh, a kind of a synchrotron type uh, um, uh, vortex of of uh, intense energy uh, that the electrons uh, spiral along, and of course that's what uh, gives off uh, a certain frequency emission, uh, decametric uh, emissions, um, which can be detected here on Earth. Um, so yeah, the um, uh, the the volcanic activity on on Io contributes certainly contributes to the uh, uh, to the um, uh, the the the, uh, the this this amazing uh, connection that, that uh, the, both Io and Jupiter have between each other, um, very interesting complex arrangement. Um, yes, yes, yes. It's a um, it's certainly a, an interesting place to uh, to land a probe <laughs> if it, if they ever do that. Thanks, uh, Andrew. And uh, your question about the dome? Uh, no, nothing has transpired at this stage. Uh, I'm I'm still in a in a limbo on this this point in time, and uh, I just uh, don't know what to do. Anyway, but nothing's happened at this point in time. Now, do we have Frank there? VK three JR. Did you call in VK three EKH? No, all right. We must have fallen asleep, or perhaps gone and joined Steve on 160 meters if he's there. <laughs> I don't know. Is there any other stations wishing to check in tonight? VK3 EKH. No, all right. Thanks everybody for joining in tonight on this extended uh, version of the uh, broadcast. Must uh, appreciate it for everybody being there. Uh, we'll be back next Friday at 10 o'clock. Um, uh, with uh, some news and uh, uh, usual articles to uh, to lace the hour. So, and hopefully, uh, we'll have a, a solar report from uh, Timothy Scove. She's um, uh, the, the the recent reports, solar reports from Timothy are, are, are up to uh, five days old, and uh, I don't see, so don't really see any point in in running that. So uh, I'm just waiting for her to uh, to broadcast a, a, a 10 minute report that 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 covers the next few days. That's that's where the the value in that comes from. So uh, we keep an eye on Timothy. <laughs> anyway, cheers everyone. Take care. Look after yourselves and uh, have a nice week. And and we'll see you next Friday. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. And uh, for more information about the ASV, just go to the, visit the website at www.asv.org.au. So on that, cheers everybody, take care. This is VK3 EKH Clear on 3541. And that's the story. That's the way it goes. Everybody's off to bed. All right, on that note, uh, we shall conclude our uh, our visions on uh, YouTube. Uh, thanks for watching. I'm glad the YouTube hang in, hang in there, hung in there. But I had to uh, knock the power on HF down uh, a fair bit to uh, stop it. So the modem is way over here. And uh, it's, a, it's a, I don't know, a, the Ethernet cable goes up and around and it's a perfect antenna. So I've got to put some isolation or get some shielded cable or maybe even bring the modem over here so the, the lead's only this long between the computer and the modem but I don't know well, uh, maybe I should just use a Wi-Fi link uh, for uh, uh, for what goes on so we'll see anyway um, I tried patching the audio from 80 meters uh, over 
the uh, through the mixer. So I don't know how that how well that came across, but I'll um, I'll do a review um, on YouTube to see uh, just how well the audio has come through. And uh, but it looks like the visions to the repeater have gone through okay. I'm, I can see I'm still there. Uh, I'm using a little tiny monitor which I've got to go all the way around here to see. Uh, so my usual uh, big monitor is uh, upstairs still. Um, so I might I was going to leave it up there actually, but um, unfortunately these these little seven inch TFT monitors that I've got in the rack here don't don't have any internal speakers. Um, so I can't really hear the sound uh, on the, on the repeater. Uh, yeah, I, I I can take audio out from the set top box, um, and I've actually got that going into the mixer right now as I speak. And uh, if, I, if I if I turn this, the, I've got that channel muted, and if I turn that, there's going to be probably some sort of echo. Some echo? Sort of echo one two. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, I won't muck around because I can't really monitor it very clearly. Anyway, so that's it. I'll uh, I'll leave it at that. Again, thanks Peter and Ian uh, for all your work on the repeater, getting this PA back and, and uh, the chap over in America for uh, for fixing it. Um, thumbs up for all your uh, uh, effort in getting that uh, fixed up for us. Much appreciated. And uh, it's, it's good to have the repeater back at full power. <sighs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's just the way the cookie crumbles, isn't it? Um, all right. I think that's about it for me. I'm just rambling on here. This is VK3EKH uh, for the Astronomical Society of Victoria, concluding transmissions tonight on YouTube and on VK3RTV, Melbourne Television Repeater, transmitting on 445 MHz UHF, DVB-T2, and uh, in full HD. So we say evening or mornings and... Um, We'll be back next week. Oh, actually, we'll do the, the we'll be back Sunday morning. Uh, do the WIA broadcast on ten thirty Sunday morning. Also on one sixty meters, I, I do the WIA broadcast on eighteen twenty five a.m. So um, I'm still still waiting to get reports from you guys that do watch here to 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 tune in to eighteen twenty five kilohertz a.m. on one sixty at nine o'clock on Sunday morning. And tell me if you can hear the signal. I'm using this device, this transmitter here, for the main broadcast, the Telefunken. And that's going down to a vertical antenna down the back about 60 metres away. So um, I, uh, as, as far as I know, I get a fairly good signal out around uh, this area. Um, and there's also Paul's uh, SDR, uh, Paul BK3KHZ. Um, Kiwi, Kiwi SDR. Uh, just type in, just uh, get Google Kiwi SDR. Look for the map, and then go down to Victoria and find VK3 KHZ. Um, KHZ, that's it. Uh, SDR. He's got a, he's got several of them, <laughs> so you, you can pick the uh, pick your one that you want. Easy, easy peasy. I, I can quickly show you that, like on the mobile phone here. There's, which there's the SDR. If I tap on that, it opens up. There's the uh, the various SDRs that he's the receivers that he's got connected, and then if I go to the top one there, that'll bring open the SDR, and then I go pick, click on the on the play button, and there it is. That's 80 meters. You can. That's three five four one. You can hear if I come up on. If I come up on 3541 right now, you'll hear it coming through this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. See, 1, 2. See, 1, 2. <laughs> Don't you love that? Modern technology. Anyway, and that Paul's SDR is 30 kilometres. <laughs> There's always somebody around. Um, I'll just turn that down if I can. There we are. So Paul's SDR is 30 kilometres from here, uh, up there at uh, um, uh, that place, just north of Warrandyte. No, what is it? Um, Mooralba, no, that's up in Queensland. Mar 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 M
Um, thanks, Paul, who may or may not be watching. Uh, Paul, Paul's interested in, in uh, astronomy as well. He's got a, a big love for astronomy. Um, and uh, once upon a time was well and truly into it. So uh, we might be able to get Paul back into uh, doing astronomy <laughs> at some stage. Once I get my dome finally up and running. Anyway, all right, that's it. Uh, we'll uh, say cheers and beers. And uh, we'll go to uh, colour bars and we'll just soft. This is VK3 EKH with VK3 CSJ on the microphone concluding transmissions for tonight. Thank you for watching.